thick tentacle from the left actually strangles Persia. Uh, and uh, the uh, tentacle on the far right uh, strangles uh, China. And so Russia is presented as the imperial power which uh, is strangling all the countries uh, uh, around it, uh, Tibet, um, uh, Korea, and so on. And I think the image of the strangling of Persia is an important one because only a few years later, another American who served Iran, uh, Morgan Schuster, will write a book called The Strangling of Persia. So uh, the image of the strangling is uh, an important one. Uh, in Iran, the victory was uh, perceived also with great joy. Um, an Iranian poet, or perhaps I should say poetaster, because this poem is really quite awful, uh, wrote an epic uh, by the name of Mikado Nami. Now, Mikado uh, is, um, as every lover of, the, uh, of Gilbert and Sullivan knows, the title of the Japanese uh, emperor in uh, those days. And so this is really a Shahnameh written for Japan. Uh, the Iranian epic tradition that began with Ferdowsi continued to the middle of the 20th century. And uh, here we have, could I have the next one too? Uh, here we have uh, this epic, which is about 100 pages, which celebrates uh, the Japanese uh, victory over the, um, over the uh, Russians. And the next one. Uh, this is what it looked like. I, originally, I had planned to read from it, but I'll uh, spare you uh, the uh, quote. Now, the Japanese victory in 1905 triggered a chain reaction of revolutions. The first one was Russia. In Russia, the satisfaction with the Tsarist regime was uh, growing, and uh, when the defeat uh, in East Asia was added to that, a revolution broke out, uh, the Tsar had to uh, accept uh, a parliament, the Duma. Inside Iran, it also had an effect, because in Iran, dissatisfaction with the absolutism of the political regime had increased very much since the late 19th century. The Shah's frequent trips to Europe had burdened the treasury, the country was bankrupt. The British and the Russians, this is uh, Mozaffaruddin Shah exactly, the British and the Russians interfered in Iranian politics. Uh, the economic situation was bad. Merchants were going out of business. And uh, modern ideas about the rule of law, about democracy, about the equality of all citizens, regardless of religion, uh, had appeared among the educated. Now, the educated, of course, are still a tiny minority of the population. Let's not forget that. So the various strands of opposition, uh, people who opposed uh, the government for different reasons, united and a revolution broke out in 1905, shortly after the Russian Revolution. And uh, to repeat, this revolution had profound domestic causes, but it also drew inspiration from Japan and from Russia, uh, because many Iranians had emigrated to Russia, especially the oil fields of Baku, and had bec become acquainted with socialist ideas through uh, their uh, neighborhood, uh, through uh, having revolutionary Russians uh, among them. Now, this is not uh, the place to uh, expatiate on uh, the uh, revolution, but uh, to make a long story short, by December 1906, the ruler, uh, Mozaffar Din Shah, uh, whom we saw in the previous picture, uh, acquiesced to a uh, constitution. Um, and where does Japan come in? It comes in because um, Japan was the only constitutional country in Asia, and Russia was the only absolute power in, Russia, in, in Europe. And so the argument that if the only constitutional power in Asia defeats the only absolutist power in Europe, then what makes the difference in uh, power relations is precisely having a constitution. Right? Uh, the constitutionalists hoped that uh, this constitution would install the state of law, uh, strengthen the state, uh, build institutions, uh, turn Iranians into patriots, into citizens, why? Because only then could they stand up to the imperialists. And that was very much uh, on their minds because the grip of the imperialists, especially Russia, was actually tightening. So it was, became a desperate effort 
to strengthen the country uh, against them. Uh, this um, constitution, the constitutional revolution, was uh, celebrated uh, around the world. Uh, here I show you a, uh, a picture of... Um, uh, no, 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 please go back to the previous one. Yes. Uh, this is an article written by a, an American journalist, uh, William Curtis, who was actually an expert on Latin America. Uh, but uh, wrote this enthusiastic article, Parliamentary Democracy Comes to Persia, in 1906. So this is a type of article that Howard Baskerville may have read uh, when he was uh, at Princeton. Uh, Princeton, let us not forget, uh, had Woodrow Wilson on its faculty. Uh, Woodrow Wilson uh, propagated uh, democracy and uh, Howard Baskerville was one of his students. Now, the optimism generated by the Constitution uh, proved to be somewhat premature uh, because the successor of uh, Mozaffar Dinshaw, who died soon after he signed the Constitution, now could I have the next image, please? Uh, Muhammad Ali Shah uh, was nostalgic uh, for the power of his uh, ancestors and uh, did not really have, could I have the next picture? Uh, and uh, wasn't uh, very much uh, in tune with uh, the constitutionalist. And, and I think his absolutist tendencies are beautifully evident in the stamp because he chose to have himself depicted on the stamp with a crown. Uh, and this really underlined his belief that uh, the crown head of state should be the man in charge, which was a break from previous uh, stamps. Could I have the next one, please? Here you see his grandfather, Nasser Din Shah, who ruled for 48 years, and he is not uh, depicted with a crown on his head. So I think even the, the iconography of Muhammad Ali Shah's reign uh, shows his, uh, his uh, disdain for uh, constitutionalism, for democracy and uh, so on. Meanwhile, uh, the imperial powers continued dividing up those countries they had not conquered uh, by the force of arms, uh, dividing them into zones of influence. In December 1906, around the time the constitution was gathering, for, the constitutional movement was gathering force, Britain, France, and Italy signed a treaty to divide Ethiopia into spheres of influence. And then in 1907, Britain and Russia signed the Anglo-Russian Convention to delineate their respective spheres of influence in the areas separating their dominions in Asia. Could we have the next picture, please? Now, in Iran, this was perceived as a betrayal. Why? Because the constitutionalists had counted on British sympathy. In fact, uh, at one point uh, in the struggle, they had organized a sit-in in the British legation when over 10,000 uh, Iranian activists took refuge in the uh, British uh, legation uh, until their demands were met. Now, how can we explain then that Britain came to an agreement with Russia? And um, I think the reason was geopolitical. Uh, they wanted to include Russia in the anti-German alliance. They wanted to include Russia into the anti-German alliance, and therefore the uh, alliance with Russia mattered much more than um, the political regime that uh, Iran would have. Now, this was, of course, not uncontested in Britain because Britain had a free press. And so this um, cartoon from the famous uh, magazine Punch uh, is actually quite uh, revealing because uh, if you see the last line, the Persian cat says, I don't remember having been consulted about this. So uh, the British and the Russian divide the Persian cat up between them and the Persian cat proceed, uh, says, I can't remember having been consulted about this. And indeed the Iranian prime minister at the time also sent a memorandum saying this is uh, outrageous they make a decision about us without actually uh, informing us about it. Now you see Persia is represented as a cat 
Uh, and of course, this probably is a reference to the famous Persian cat. Uh, but it's more than that. And could I have the next picture, please? Uh, Iran, it so happens, uh, has uh, the shape of a cat. Uh, and so the, uh, the image of Iran being represented as a cat has really two sources. One is this one. Uh, the other one is the uh, Persian cat. So uh, in other words, uh, could I have image 17 now? The next image. By, uh, by the end of 1907, all the rest of the world, of the Asian world, had been divided into zones of influence. The division was complete. Um, in Southeast Asia, uh, you see the eastern parts of Siam, close to French Indochina, were the French zone of influence. The southern parts of uh, Thailand, uh, close to Malaya, were the British zone of influence. Tibet, uh, a tributary state of China, was in the British zone of influence. Um, Oman was a British protectorate, um, and Afghanistan was a British protectorate, and finally coming to Iran, you see that uh, the Russian zone of influence includes roughly the northern third of Iran, and the British influence uh, only the southeast of Iran. Now, many people argued, and I would agree with them, that uh, the Russians got the better deal in this. Uh, the British zone is quite small. The neutral zone uh, is between, and uh, the northern zone is huge, and it includes uh, Tehran, the capital. It, it includes Tabriz, uh, the city which was by then the most cosmopolitan of Iranian cities because of the contact with the Caucasus and with the Ottoman Empire. It includes Mashhad, uh, the country's most important uh, religious shrine. Uh, and the British really only wanted to safeguard the borders of India. Now, uh, what, the, what did this division uh, of Iran into zones of influence mean practically uh, for Iran? Um, and here I want to quote from Lord Curzon. Lord Curzon was the former Viceroy of India, and uh, by 1907, he was the Chancellor of the University of Oxford, and in that capacity, he gave a talk in 1907, in which he defined what this zone of influence actually meant. And I will uh, read you his, what he said, quote, protectorates shade away by imperceptible degrees into the diplomatic concept now popular known as, popularly known as spheres of influence. It implies a stage at which no exterior power but one may, exert, may assert itself in the territory so described. In other words, foreign powers get a monopoly in their zone of influence. I continue reading from his uh, lecture. The native government is as a rule left undisturbed. Indeed, its unabated sovereignty it some is sometimes specifically reaffirmed. And it was in the Anglo-Russian Convention. And I continue. But commercial exploitation and political influence are regarded as the peculiar right of the interested power. No body of rules can, however, be laid down, for it is obvious that a sphere of influence in a still independent kingdom like Iran must be very different, must be a very different thing from a sphere of influence among the semi barbarous tribes of Bahr al Ghazal or the Niger. So he says, still independent kingdom of Iran. I think that is very important because the expectation was that uh, Iran, Thailand, Ethiopia, and all these countries one day in the not so distant future would follow the destiny of India, Algeria, Morocco, and all these other countries that uh, had uh, become European colonies, right? Still independent Iran, let's divide it up and see perhaps one day southeastern Iran will be part of British India and northern Iran will be part of uh, Russia with little buffer state uh, uh, in the middle. So, uh, as I said before, Tehran was in the Russian zone. Uh, the Russians favored absolutism in Iran. Um, by then, the Russian revolution had petered out and uh, Nicholas II had been able to reassert his uh, absolutism in Russia. The Duma, the parliament, had become unimportant. Um, so they also favored absolutism in Iran. And the new Shah, Muhammad Ali Shah, was also 
a favor in favor of uh, absolutism. So this uh, this brought them uh, together. Inside Iran, uh, many conservatives opposed the constitution and uh, supported the Shah, who uh, found an ally in a high-ranking cleric. Uh, could I have the next picture? Sheikh Fazlullah Nuri, who doctrinally uh, opposed democracy. He abhorred the equality of Muslims and non-Muslims. And uh, he felt that if secular ideas, as embodied by the constitution and the constitutionalist conceptions of what, uh, Iranian, what the Iranian future should be, uh, would in the long run weaken the hold of religion, in this case, uh, 12 Shiism, on uh, Iranians. And uh, so uh, we get then an alliance between the Russians, the conservative wing of the Shiite clergy, and uh, the Shah. And this enabled Muhammad Ali Shah to carry out a coup d'etat uh, with the help of Russian officers in the employ of the government. Uh, parliament is bombarded, uh, but the uh, triumph isn't complete because this is the beginning of a civil war. There is resistance in many places. And uh, one of the more important centers of resistance, perhaps the most important center of resistance, is Tabriz, the capital of the Iranian province of Azerbaijan in the northwest of the country. Now, as I said before, Tabriz was the most cosmopolitan city in Iran. It was close to the Caucasus. It was close to the Ottoman Empire. It had a large native Christian population of uh, Armenian and Assyrians. Uh, many Europeans lived there, various European and American missionaries uh, were there. Uh, a Presbyterian mission from the United States had operated uh, a school uh, for many years. Uh, the knowledge of foreign languages was uh, uh, better. And since the local language of uh, Azerbaijan is Turkish, uh, the Muslims in Azerbaijan had access to all the modernist literature that was coming out of the Ottoman Empire and uh, out of the Caucasus. So in other words, uh, the people were acquainted with modern ideas much more than in a place like uh, Isfahan, say, or uh, Shiraz. Uh, moreover, this resistance was helped and supported by revolutionaries from the Caucasus. Uh, these were of different ethnic and religious groups. We find Armenians, Georgians, Russians, uh, Azeris, even a Bulgarian had found his way to that part of the world. These were people who had an experience of the Russian Revolution. They were also, all of these uh, Caucasians and Iranians were in contact with the Young Turks in the neighboring Ottoman Empire, where a revolution had also broken out in 1908. So what we find is instances of revolutionary solidarity and cooperation between people of different ethnic groups and uh, different religions spanning Russia, Iran, and the uh, Ottoman Empire, uh, in fact. Uh, and could I have uh, image 29, uh, 20, please? This uh, is a picture which shows you the people who defended uh, the uh, constitution in uh, Tabriz. Uh, the Russians were only waiting to interfere. Uh, their troops were uh, mobilized on the Iranian border and uh, if things got out of hand they would always have the pretext of uh, protecting the large numbers of Europeans, Russians uh, who lived in, uh, uh, in uh, Tabriz. In other words, Russian pressure grew. Um, and can I have the next picture please? Here we find uh, another caricature from uh, England, uh, which shows uh, Russia now sitting on the Persian cat and the British lion uh, looking at it uh, from afar. Um, the lion is not necessarily happy about what he sees, uh, the Russian preponderance, uh, but uh, again, the alliance with Russia took precedence over support for Iranian liberals. Uh, Russia had to be uh, maintained uh, in an alliance with Britain, given the escalating tensions with Germany, which ultimately uh, six years, five years later, would lead to uh, World War I. So um, Tabriz uh, is uh, basically 
the uh, center of the resistance. And this is the city precisely in which Howard Baskerville had been teaching since uh, late 1907 uh, at the American Missionary School. Uh, could I have image 22? For those of you who still haven't seen a picture of uh, Howard Baskerville, uh, here he is. Uh, he had been a student at Princeton, a student of uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson in the politics department. And given Woodrow Wilson's emphasis on constitutionalism, on democracy, he could only sympathize with those who wanted to defend the city against the royalists who were besieging. So we have a royalist army on the outskirts and uh, the people inside the city trying to defend it. And now could I have the next image, please? Here you see the defenders of uh, the uh, city. Now in England, uh, many people were outraged by the lack of governmental support for uh, the liberals, um, especially the Irish. Uh, uh, at this point, Ireland was still part of the United Kingdom. Uh, there were uh, dozens of Irish nationalists sitting uh, in the parliament at Westminster. Uh, they uh, felt a sense of kinship with uh, Iran and they agitated for a change in British uh, policy. Uh, one of the people who was most active, of course, uh, in this was the famous Orientalist uh, Edward Grenville Brown. Uh, who uh, had lived in Iran and who uh, is famous to this day for his four-volume history of uh, Persian literature. A liberal newspaper, the Manchester Guardian, which is a forerunner of the newspaper called The Guardian today, sent a reporter to Tabriz, uh, Arthur Moore, and both Arthur Moore and uh, Howard Baskerville actually joined constitutional forces against the, dip the wishes of the diplomats of their respective countries who didn't want them to uh, intervene. Uh, Baskerville, as is well known, uh, is killed uh, in his first attempt at organizing a sortie with the Iranian students he had trained, but more, Arthur Moore actually survives and uh, returns to uh, England. Uh, ultimately, uh, the uh, revolutionaries uh, prevail in uh, 1909. Uh, the Shah takes refuge in the Russian legation uh, and uh, ultimately uh, leaves uh, the country and uh, goes into exile in Russia. He makes an, an effort to come back but is beaten back and again has to go back to Russia, except that in 1917 a revolution breaks out in Russia and uh, he has to leave again uh, and goes into a second exile. Uh, this time in Italy and dies in 1925. Uh, now, the uh, people who gain control of uh, the capital tend to be uh, the most radical elements of the constitutional coalition. And could I have uh, the next image, please? Uh, Ayatollah uh, Fazlullah Nouri is hanged. Uh, he is hanged. Uh, with the support of the constitutional ulama, um, they could find nobody to hang him. No Muslim wants to uh, hang a, a, high, a leading cleric. And so one of the Caucasian uh, Armenians, uh, Yipram Khan, uh, finds uh, a, uh, an Armenian uh, fighter to actually put the noose uh, around his uh, neck. And this uh, creates a lingering bitter taste in uh, the mouths of uh, many clerics. Not all of them, I should add, because uh, he represented only the conservative wing of the clerics, and there was also a liberal wing among the clergy who were wholeheartedly in support of the uh, Constitution. They had actually written treatises to refute uh, Nuri's argument in favor of discrimination against non-Muslims. Uh, for instance, uh, but to the conservative clerics, Ayatollah Nouri became a, uh, a, a martyr and uh, he has been celebrated in Iran since uh, 1979, since the uh, Islamic Revolution. Now, could I have the next image, please? With Muhammad Ali Shah in exile, they decided uh, to play it safe and uh, put a child on the throne. 
uh, who would not have any uh, ambitions to uh, become an absolute ruler. And this is 11-year-old Ahmad Shah. Ahmad Shah, the son of Muhammad Ali Shah, uh, Sultan Ahmad was his first name, uh, was born in 1898. Uh, he becomes ruler in 1909, of course, with a regency, uh, with regents exercising the prerogatives of the head of state under the constitution of uh, 1906, 1907. The constitution is reinstated and uh, a second parliament is actually uh, elected. The first one had been bombarded, as I said. A second uh, uh, parliament is elected in 1909, uh, but uh, this parliament then um, uh, invites uh, Morgan Schuster to come to Iran to uh, put order into Iran fi Iran's finances. Morgan Schuster does a very good job, uh, but he goes after people who had Russian protection. And uh, so the Russians give the Iranian government an ultimatum to uh, get rid of uh, Morgan Schuster. Their troops uh, consolidate their uh, control over northern Iran. Uh, Morgan Schuster leaves after 1911. All the north of Iran is essentially under Russian occupation. Uh, the British uh, start uh, being more active in uh, the south of Iran. Uh, and that's precisely when Morgan Schuster writes his book, uh, The Strangling of Persia. Uh, and it's a story of how this uh, constitutional movement, which was meant to, in fact, strengthen Iran and enable it to stand up to uh, the imperial powers in the north and the south how this constitutional movement in fact is thwarted uh, and uh, the uh, imperialism uh, takes over but iran is a constitutional monarchy again uh, the reactionaries are routed uh, but soon after that world war one breaks out and um, to coin a phrase uh, all things uh, fall apart and this is uh, where I will end my narrative. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Hu Zhang for that fantastic presentation of uh, putting together the transnational, regional, and international forces that impacted Iran's history. And with that ending on Fazlur al Nuri, you really summarized why those actions bring the reaction that we have seen after the 79 revolution. If I recall, he was one of the clerics that Ayatollah Khomeini mentioned uh, in his writings as not having been treated. Well, so that was a great presentation. Uh, it was very enlightening. I always learn more on different aspects of it. And I was really impressed by how the Japanese element had influenced their constitutionalists. So with that, I, we go to Matt Shannon and then uh, start uh, taking questions from the audience. Thank you. Um, 